Ah, there we go. All right. So I'm tabbing back and forth between uh, windows here. Welcome everybody to Computer Science 3200. I uh, am streaming to YouTube this year, and so that should be very interesting. So here we are. Uh, just let me know out there in the chat if you can hear me. I think the volume levels are okay. Everything should be fine in terms of that. Uh, let me just go to my settings real quick. All right, everyone can hear me, that's great. All right. So uh, last time I taught during the pandemic, it was on Twitch, but we are on YouTube this year. Uh, YouTube actually has a number of features that are really nice um, in comparison to Twitch. For example, you can actually like rewind a live stream so you can go back and, and watch stuff. It has the same chatting functionality and it uploads it straight to the YouTube channel. So the video will be there uh, forever, which is nice. So no more having to record things and uh, upload it to, to YouTube later. So welcome to Computer Science 3200. Uh, this is one of, if not my favorite courses to teach. Um, you can sort of see this course, the, the, the real title for the course is Algorithmic Techniques for Artificial Intelligence. But you can see this course as sort of a, an overview of an introduction to artificial intelligence and algorithms that go along with it. So here we are, uh, this is the, uh, the D2L homepage for the course. So if you're a registered student, you'll be, able to see, um, you'll be able to see this page where we have all of our links and all of our assignment submissions and stuff like that. Um, let me uh, walk you through all of the documents and stuff that you'll need for the course this year. So if we go over to my homepage here, so this is just uh, my, my teaching homepage, you click teaching, you get here. So I'm teaching two courses this year. Um, the other course that I'm teaching is Computer Science 4300, that's in the mornings, um, but this course is Computer Science 3200. So if you click this link, it will take you to the, the D2L page. And uh, if you click this link, it will take you to this Google Sheet, which um, is going to be sort of our class schedule for the term. And I'll go over that in a minute. Um, over here, as soon as this video is ready, so right after the lecture finishes, uh, this link will be active and you'll be able to see the YouTube playlist of all of the videos um, for this course for this year. So if you want to just uh, browse through all the videos, they'll be there. And um, if you want to see the course syllabus, you can click this link right here and it'll open up the course syllabus for you. So uh, the beginning of the term is always a little bit hectic. I'm sure you have a lot of courses that you're dealing with. Um, so this lecture is all just about, you know, an introduction to the course itself what you're going to uh, expect in the course, how we're going to be conducting all the lectures, um, what the marking scheme is, and then maybe just like a brief introduction to, hey, what is artificial intelligence? Because I'm sure everyone has, sir, has heard some sort of definition of what AI is over the years, and we'll see uh, what I have to say on the topic. So first, let's go to that Google spreadsheet. So this is also um, on the D2L page, so you can come over here, and you can click on the course spreadsheet and it'll take you to that course spreadsheet. It's actually embedded within um, the page on D2L, which is really nice, but you can visit the, the page on its own and this lets me zoom in on it really nicely. So let's just go with this. So here is our uh, class schedule for this year. And the class schedule lists every lecture that we have, um, all the topics for all of those lectures. It will link you to the PDF slides. So in the initial, um, uh, news announcement on D2L. I said that uh, there's going to be a username and password for those slides, but there's not. So those slides are actually going to be hosted on D2L and clicking this link will take you straight to the D2L page where those slides are. So um, all you need to do to follow along with this course is have this spreadsheet open um, either by itself or on D2L and you'll be able to click straight through to the slides or to the YouTube video or to the download video. Over here, um, you can see all of the assignments, when those are planned, when they'll be released, and uh, how much time you have to do them and what the due date is. All assignments in this class are due at 11.59 p.m. on the day that they're released. Okay, so there'll be penalties if assignments are submitted late. And all of the assignments are going to be submitted on D2L. So if you come over here on D2L and you click on assignments, you can see that there's five assignments and it says when it's due. And so you'll click there and there's instructions on how to submit the assignments, etc. So that's all um, that. 
you can see here in red that there will be two exams in this course. So the exams, uh, the, the lectures for this class are actually being delivered remotely. So you'll have access to these lectures. You can rewatch them. You can um, learn the material that way. But there are two in-person exams for this course, and there's no exception to that, okay? So if you're not able to make in-person exams for this class, then you cannot take the class. So you have to be a registered student who's in St. John's able to take um, these uh, these midterms in person. And the final exam has not been scheduled yet, but as soon as it is, I will um, I'll put it down here um, what the what the room number is and what the time and what the day are for the final. Uh, we have some some links here, but basically that's what this spreadsheet is. It's your one-stop shop to everything that this course entails. You can see in here in blue when all the assignments are being given out and when all the assignments are due, etc. So I hope hopefully that lets you keep um, track of the course, where we're at in the course, and where to get the slides, and where to get all the videos and stuff. So that's what that uh, spreadsheet is, and I think it really helps, stay, um, helps the course stay organized over time. Uh, let's have a look at the syllabus now. So, you know, we'll see what the, what the class is all about. So again, it's Computer Science 3200, um, Algorithmic Techniques for Artificial Intelligence. So that's the name of the course. Um, so we'll be doing a bunch of algorithms, and those algorithms will be related to AI in some way. Um, so I'm the instructor. My name is David Churchill. I'm a professor in the Department of Computer Science at Memorial, where the course is being held. Um, just pretend that my phone number doesn't exist because I'm never there um, in my office. But email me at any time. I, I find my Gmail. I'll, I'll respond quicker if you use my Gmail um, as opposed to my uh, Mon email address. Uh, this is just a link to the teaching website, again, where you can find all the links to all my course stuff. All right, so course objectives. What is this course all about? So this course is an introduction to artificial intelligence, or AI, covering algorithmic techniques and data structures used in modern problem-solving environments. Each topic that we learn will have a related assignment where the learned techniques are applied to simple games. And so in this course, we're actually going to be applying these techniques to some games that I made. So for example, our very first assignment is on video game pathfinding. So we're gonna learn uh, a pathfinding technique using some AI algorithm, and we'll apply that to a really cool little video game pathfinding um, scenario. Uh, so the course outline. First, we're going to talk about um, well, an intro to AI. So what is artificial intelligence? What can artificial intelligence do? Why do we care about testing games, um, testing AI in games as an environment? And we'll also talk about, you know, give all of the, the necessary definitions and stuff about agents, environments, problems, how they're well specified, how we write algorithms for AI, etc. cetera. Um, in the first half of the course, we will talk about search algorithms. So search algorithms are sort of, you know, they're an older, but really established way of approaching certain AI problems. Um, believe it or not, machine learning is not the only form of artificial intelligence. And if you are taking this course expecting to learn a lot about machine learning, you are going to be disappointed. This is not a machine learning course. This is an introduction to AI as a whole and a bunch of different algorithms. There is actually a machine learning course at MUN. So there's an undergraduate course in machine learning, and that is all about machine learning. Um, this one is not all about machine learning. However, we will talk about it a little bit, but again, it's not just about machine learning. People think AI is equivalent to machine learning and that is not um, whatsoever. Um, I saw someone out there mentioning the video quality. If your video quality seems low, then in the bottom right hand corner, um, there's a little gear icon and you should be able to choose the highest quality. So this is being streamed at 1080p. So it's pretty high quality resolution. And if you're not seeing the full quality resolution while streaming, then it will be available um, once the video is processed afterwards. But thank you for asking. It's a good question. So we'll talk about search algorithms. We'll do exhaustive search. Um, so breadth first search and depth first search algorithms you may have seen before, but presented in a new way that's going to be pretty exciting. Um, heuristic search and heuristic functions. So we'll talk about best first search, A star search. Uh, then we'll go into an introduction to game theory and Nash equilibrium. And that's going to let us do uh, adversarial search. So the minimax and alpha beta algorithms. And we're actually, assignment three is going to be using alpha beta to play a board game. And we're going to have a class competition 
um, with that board game. So you'll be able to flex your algorithmic muscle in assignment three. Um, then we're going to talk about some data structures and optimizations for search, especially when it comes to assignment two and the A star search algorithm. Um, assignment four is going to be on the next topic, which is genetic algorithms. So evolutionary, uh, evolutionary algorithms, what they are, how they work. Um, and then we will do a genetic algorithm to solve some sort of game scenario. I'm not decided if we're going to do the same thing as last year or apply it to something new, but it'll be cool. And then we will talk about reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is a type of machine learning. Um, we are not going to go into deep reinforcement learning, which utilizes neural networks and stuff. We are going to be doing tabular reinforcement learning. Um, but it will give you a very good background information on what reinforcement learning is, why it is so powerful, and we will be implementing it from scratch, okay? So we'll be talking about, again, the reinforcement learning problem, how we phrase those problems, um, and how we can solve them. We'll talk about bandit problems, exploration versus exploitations, MDPs, um, generalized policy iteration, Monte Carlo methods, temporal difference learning. So all of these different ways that will set you up for maybe at some point in the future, if you do want to do something like deep reinforcement learning or DQN or any of these more modern algorithms, you will have the algorithmic foundation for knowing how those work and why they're important. And then finally, we will um, be ending with a brief intro to neural networks, okay? But again, there's an entire machine learning course at Memorial, and I don't want there to be too much overlap. So we will talk about neural networks. We'll give an introduction to how they work, and then maybe give like one lecture on what deep learning is as a sort of send off into the modern day of, of, uh, of artificial intelligence. Um, I see a number of other ch uh, questions out there in the chat, but they will all of, all of those questions will be answered. So I will just continue on with the uh, with the lecture. So there are two optional textbooks for this course. Um, the first textbook is really excellent. It's called Artificial Intelligence, A Modern Approach. And if you want to get this book and you want to use it to help you study for the exams or do the assignments, you're more than welcome to do that, but it is completely optional. You can get by fine without it. And the second textbook is actually available free online. If you just click this link, it's available there online. It's by Sutton and Bartow, and Rich Sutton is like the grandfather of reinforcement learning, and I was lucky enough to actually take a reinforcement learning course with Rich Sutton when I was at the University of Alberta. And this textbook is the best textbook that I have ever read. It's in like plain English, it doesn't scare you with too much math, it's really easy to follow along. And so once we get into the second half of the course, and we start talking about reinforcement learning, if there's some topic that you're not quite understanding, the textbook is there for you to be able to look at to get um, to get a better, you know, more detail about that so that you're, you know, you're better prepared for the exams on those questions. Uh, but again, it's optional, but this textbook is online, so there's no reason not to have a look at it. The format of the course, we're going to be, um, lectures are going to be delivered remotely. So if you're watching this live right now, this is what we're going to do every class at the scheduled class time of 3.30. Um, and then immediately once this uh, is over, the recording will be there on YouTube for you to watch. And I'll also be uploading maybe to D2L, maybe to my website, I'm not sure yet. And, and another way to get at the videos if you're registered for the course. Um, and the midterm and final exams will uh, take place in person on the MUN campus, okay? And that's because it is impossible to prevent cheating with midterms. And so we're just having in-person midterms. And it's good because I get to see you all in person uh, eventually during the course. Um, but yeah, so the midterms and the final are going to be, or sorry, the midterm and final is, uh, is going to be in person. So the evaluation of the course. Um, we are going to be doing a lot of programming in this course. In my opinion, you don't learn something until you have implemented it. And I am going to take the algorithm stick and beat you over the head with it this term. And you are going to be implementing algorithms until your eyes bleed. But trust me, people have given me good feedback that it's actually useful. I've gotten emails from two people this year that they've, that they've used these algorithms in their work. And so it's, it's really cool that they, they get to apply this to uh, stuff that they do in their work. But the algorithms are really fun. We get to play some games. We have little competitions with all the assignments. And so it's a lot of work, but you will learn a lot, right? Which is what an ideal course should be. It's not too much work, but I think you'll enjoy it. Um, each of the assignments can be done in groups of up to two people. 
So find a partner. Um, I will have a uh, uh, channel on Discord. So I've I've got a Discord server for my classes. Uh, it's only for registered students in the course. The link is here on uh, D2L if you go to Course Home and you'll see this Discord server link. I'm not gonna mouse over it. I don't want the link to be public, but, and don't share that um, outside the class, but you can join the Discord. Um, we can chat along there. Um, yeah, so the assignments, there's five of them. And those five assignments are worth 50%. They're approximately 10% each, but some of them are more work than others and you'll get more time than others. So um, you can see the exact breakdown on D2L if you want to. Then there's a midterm exam and a final exam. And of course, these finals are going to be written by hand, in person, on campus. Um, the exams are very fair. If you did all the assignments and you watched all the lectures, lectures and you studied a little bit, you should be absolutely fine for the um, for the exams. Now, um, this is something that scares people, but I, I'm a firm believer in this um, because of the fact that it's remotely delivered and the fact that um, all the assignments are done in group work, uh, meaning that you could potentially get carried um, through this if you have a partner who is generous enough to do all the work for you. And because of that, to effectively show that you've individually learned the material, you must pass the final exam to pass the course. Okay, so that basically means if you get less than 50 on the final, then you're not passing the course. However, please don't, don't worry about that. I know it's scary and it creates a little bit of anxiety going into the final. The final is going to be very, very fair, right? It's not like gotcha questions or anything like this. And nobody has ever failed my final who wasn't already completely failing the course, okay? So if you do really well in all of your assignments, there has not been a single student ever who has done really well in all the assignments and failed the final, okay? Um, so, but just to make sure that you have actually learned the material, I don't want you to be able to get 50% of the course in the assignments and then maybe a few percent on the midterm and then not have to do the final exam. Okay, so you've got to show that you've actually learned the material. Okay, uh, standard COVID notice. All right, I don't need to go through that. We all know about COVID by now. It's been a ridiculously long time since COVID started. Um, academic misconduct. I hate having to give this speech, but statistically speaking, 10% of you will try and cheat this year. Between five and 10%. Ask anybody who's taken my course about me and cheating, okay? I take it very, very, very seriously. Trust me when I say that it will be much easier for you to just learn the material and do it yourself than it will be to cheat in this course, okay? Especially for remotely delivered courses. Anyone found cheating will receive the harshest possible academic penalties. If I find you cheating, you're just, you're done for the course, okay? There's no second chances. There is no excuse for cheating. You have to try to cheat. There is no accidental cheating, okay? Now, if you do some work and, you know, it looks sort of like something that was on Stack Overflow, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about like actual academic misconduct, right? I had someone once like get pay someone in Zimbabwe to do their assignment for them. And like, it's so obvious when you get someone who's not taking the course to do the assignment for you. I'm teaching these algorithms in a very specific way. Everything you need to know is in the notes. If you get someone else to do the assignments for you, I'll know, okay? And, or if you get the solutions off of any external website, I'll know. And not only will I know, but I can tell you the website that you got it from because I know them all. This is what I do for a living. I've been doing this for longer than some of you have been alive, okay? I know I, I'm not that old, but I've been doing this for a long time. I mark hundreds and hundreds of assignments every year and I know what I taught and I know what you're capable of, okay? Now, it's not gonna be the case that, you know, you, you don't cheat, I suspect you of cheating, and I immediately, like, 
blow up on you. I'll ask you questions. I'll, you know, interview you, whatever. See if you know your stuff. If you do, fine. We're talking about like cut and dry, obvious you, you cheated for this course. Some professors have different things that they mean by cheating or academic misconduct, okay? So what do I mean by cheating or academic misconduct? A, handing in any material for evaluation that was done outside of you or your group, okay? Don't do that. That's not good. Do your own work. Obtaining solutions from any class source, such as outside of your group, previous course offerings, Stack Overflow, etc. Now, there is going to be a very specific exception to this. And that very specific exception is once you have done all of the required work on your own, if there's a bonus objective for the assignment, you are allowed to seek out bonus things, okay? But not the actual required material. That's, that's where I draw the line on that. So if you're really desperate to get another like 5% speed up somehow in your code, then, you know, you can go online and look for optimizations. I encourage that. I want your code to run as fast as possible. But you have to do all of the work that I want you to do on your own. This is equally as important. Sharing any assignment or exam questions outside of the course for any reason, including assignment sharing websites or online repos such as GitHub. You think we don't know about Chegg or GitHub or all these Russian sites that sell, sell assignments and stuff? You're joking. I, re I have them all bookmarked. I check them regularly. The assignments that you get for this course are going to be individually downloaded by all of you. And I'll get, it, I'll get more into this when we talk about assignment one. All of the files in the assignment are going to have all of your personal information inserted into those files, your names, your student numbers, in plain text and in hidden text, okay? So if any of those files end up online, I will know what student put it online. I'll, I'll know that. I'm, it's mathematically provable that I'll know who it is. So please do not do that. Um, the reverse engineering of any obfuscated solution code that I give to you. So what I do for a couple of the assignments is I give you a solution. That solution has obfuscated code, meaning it's scrambled up, right? So it's JavaScript. I'll talk about that in a bit. It's obfuscated. It is going to be so much more work for you to be able to deobfuscate that JavaScript and hand it into me and somehow sneak it by me than it is for you to just do the assignment yourself. And all of the all of the, the obfuscated solution code that I give you was done in a way that is not the same algorithm as what you are implementing. So it will not help you at all to, to try and reverse engineer the solution code that I give you. It will be 10 times as difficult as that, right? So do not use anything you got online and do not submit anything that you did online, even after the course is over. Do not put your solutions on GitHub. I have bookmarks for searches for this stuff. I will find it. I have taken it down. I've sent DMCA requests. Do not put it on GitHub. If you use GitHub to do your assignment with your partner, it has to be a private repository. I am so serious about this, and this is your warning. And if you do it, you are living with the consequences of that. Okay? So just be warned. However, if you don't cheat, I'm the nicest guy in the world. So just don't cheat. Okay? I hate having to say that, but people are going to do it. And all of you good students out there who just want to learn and do your assignments, you're all amazing and I love you for it. But the few bad apples always, always, always ruin it. And I need to have this in there so that when I catch them, and I will because they'll still do it, when I catch them, I, I've, I can point to this video and say, I warned you, okay? And some other policy stuff that you can read that I'm not going to go into. Alrighty, so that is the syllabus. Um, someone out there said, can we use Stack Overflow? Rewind the video and, and say what I said, or just listen to what I said, because I explained all that already. 
All right, so this is the first lecture. That was the course syllabus. Um, you're familiar with D2L. You are a third year student at Memorial. I don't need to go over all this with you. Um, so let's jump into the lecture for the day because I have some slides to explain what is artificial intelligence. So let's do the uh, slide view. Alrighty, here we go. So let me take a, a drink here, here real quick. This lecture won't be too long. Um, you know, this isn't sort of exam material. This is just a, a brief intro. All the exam stuff starts in the next lecture. Okie dokie. So computer science 3200. Intro to AI is how I view the course. I've had talks with, you know, the undergrad committee about the name of the course, but algorithmic techniques for art artificial intelligence is a pretty good name, if not very verbose. So today we're going to just talk about what is AI, uh, talk about some AI categories and examples of AI, and then some applications. What can AI actually do? But first, just a quick note, some notes about the course itself. There is no required textbook for this course. I've already stated that. As such, the slides for this course are designed to be the study material. So normally if you're giving a good presentation, right? If you're give, getting up in front of your company or uh, let's say a conference or something like that and you're giving a presentation, uh, you want there to be as little text as possible, right? You just want to talk, maybe have some diagrams, etc. However, for this course, I have specifically designed, for, designed it so that the slides are really all you need to study from, okay? Now, of course, you can go study, you know, an algorithm online, but it'll be in the notes, okay? So just look at the notes first. And that's why there's, on some slides, there's a lot of text, is so that you can study from the slides themselves. You should be able to do all of the assignments and study for, for the exams from these slides, okay? So I know that a bunch of professors will use the cop-out uh, of, hey, if it's in the course, it can be on the exam, right? But I can specifically tell you that everything on the exam will be from these slides, okay? Because there is no required textbook. So there's no gotcha. It will be on these slides. So as long as you look through all the slides, and if you listen to the lectures and you understood it, then you're ready for the exams. So class lectures are going to be a mixture of me reading from the slides, as well as some other demos, some live coding, and a bunch of visuals, right? However, just keep in mind that the slide files are going to be given as PDFs. So if there were some um, like animations, in some of the actual slides that I'm giving during the lecture, those animations will not be playing um, in the PDF file. So just be aware of that. All right, I already got some questions about the programming language. We are using JavaScript in this course. JavaScript, believe it or not. Why in the hell would I use JavaScript for an AI course? Well, let's talk about that. This really is an algorithms course. Okay, this course is all about teaching you these algorithms. Algorithms do not have a programming language tied to them. Okay, we can use whatever programming language we want in order to implement the algorithms that we teach in this course. However, what is really important for learning these algorithms is visualization and user interface. Okay, so luckily for us, HTML and JavaScript and a little bit of CSS allows for very robust and interesting user interfaces in order to help us learning, uh, to help us learn. So we're gonna have like a game or a map, a video game map, that'll be assignment one. It'll be just be a, an HTML page. You can just open it up right in your browser, okay? We don't require any IDE, any special software, anything in this course all you need in order to do this course is any text editor, literally notepad will do, okay? Now I recommend Visual Studio Code because it's a nice editor that has nice syntax highlighting and stuff, um, and a browser. So I happen to use Firefox, you can use Firefox, you can use Chrome, you can use Edge. I will be demonstrating Firefox in this course. Um, it turns out that for some of the algorithms, they actually run faster. So 
Chrome's JavaScript engine is faster than Firefox's JavaScript engine, unfortunately, but that's fine. But the good thing for you, Mac, Linux, uh, Windows, BSD, Chrome OS, doesn't matter, okay? All you need is a text editor and a web browser. I have seen some people, when they, when they do the assignments, they have, they load the assignments up in some sort of like IDE that like launches a local web server and stuff. You don't need that. You literally just double click the HTML file. Okay. You edit the JavaScript code and then you refresh the HTML file. That's all you need to do for the programming in this course. So it's very easy to get into. And the JavaScript that you will need to know for this course, so I just had a question, will we be penalized to have types in JavaScript to make it easier when coding? No. So pretty much however you get it to work, I will be giving some guidelines for JavaScript programming. Um, all you need to know in terms of JavaScript for this course is what a class is. And I've even given you all the skeleton code, all the classes, okay? So really, all you need to know in JavaScript is how to set up a new variable, how to set up an array, a two-dimensional array, so an array of arrays, how to index things in those arrays, and how to write a for loop, okay? That's basically it. Like, if you know absolutely zero JavaScript, sure, go watch a little JavaScript tutorial. That'll help you. But it's so basic that if you know any Python, if you know any Java, if you know any C, you'll be absolutely fine for this course, okay? Complete JavaScript beginners are welcome here. And we will talk about more about what you need to know specifically and how it's all structured once we get to assignment one. Don't worry about assignment one for now. You'll have plenty of time to work on assignment one. Assignment one is pretty easy. Assignment one is the here's you getting used to JavaScript assignment, okay? And the hardest thing that we will do in assignment one is a two-dimensional array in JavaScript. So if you have time now and you want to go prepare, um, just, just go write a 2D array in JavaScript on a web page, okay? It's all set up for you. Trust me. It's going to be almost identical to programming in Java. And in if you've used Python, instead of typing self dot you're going to be typing this dot, right? It's very minor changes. Trust me, when you see assignment one, you'll wipe the, spread, the sweat off your brow. You'll be fine. So the reason I know that JavaScript is kind of slow, but the point of this course is to learn the algorithms. The key to learning the algorithms is visualizations and user interfaces. And HTML and JavaScript allows for really great easy to use visualizations. You don't have to worry about, oh my God, do I need a compiler or blah, blah, blah. It's just there and it's gonna work, okay? So do not worry about the technical side of things for this course. All right, that's all I have to say about the course. Um, any other questions I can answer? Someone said, I was worried about this course, but seeing you talk makes it uh, a bit better. Um, comments that can, no, so, this is not TypeScript, okay? There is no TypeScript in this course. It is literally all just JavaScript. Now, what I give in the slides for this course, the slides will have pseudocode in them. Pseudocode meaning it looks like code, but it is not JavaScript. So what you will have to do is take the algorithm, which on the slide is given as pseudocode, and then turn it into JavaScript, right? So if I say for each element in the array, if I type that out, in English, obviously you have to do some translation to JavaScript for that, but it is not TypeScript. It is just pure JavaScript, no external libraries. All right, use whatever text editor you want. I'll be using Visual Studio Code when I show you the assignments. Alrighty. What is artificial intelligence? Anyone out there have an answer for me? Because I don't know. And I've been doing this stuff for 15 years now. I don't know what AI is. How many companies out there say they use AI to power their toaster? Right? Like, it's crazy. You can't answer this question. So I'm going to do a little bit of hand waving, a little bit of my, like, you know, what I think AI might be. But just keep in mind that there's no actual answer for this question. 
Okay, so what is AI is not going to be an exam question because it would be a 10 page answer. But let me try and give my answer for what is AI. All right, first of all, let's break down the two words in artificial intelligence, okay? One is intelligence. And the definition that I've seen of intelligence that I like the most is the, the capacity for either learning, reasoning, understanding, or problem solving. Maybe some sort of decision making, right? So intelligence is weird because like something is intelligence, it, it's intelligent if it looks intelligent, right? There's no, there's no like strict definition for what intelligence is. But you could go out there and say, okay, you know, a tree is doing something really complex, but is a tree intelligent, right? Well, it's not really doing any learning or problem solving, so maybe it's not intelligent, okay? The next term, artificial. So what does artificial mean, right? So artificial intelligence, to me, means essentially the building of a piece of software, so a program or a machine that appears intelligent to the user in some domain, right? So appears intelligent. Because as far as I know, there is no test for intelligence. We'll talk about the Turing test a little bit in this lecture, but there is no strict definition of intelligence. So when you say, what is AI? If you had a gun to my head and I had to say a one sentence answer, it would be a piece of software or hardware that somehow makes decisions that appear intelligent to somebody. That's about it, okay? Now, you may have also heard the term strong or general AI. And what this means is when you know you hear about the singularity or how close is Google to general into artificial intelligence, all that kind of nonsense. Strong or general AI essentially means build a system that's good at everything. Nobody is even close to building a system that's good at everything. Trust me when I say that. And if any company or any researcher says that, hey, we have this one thing that does a bunch of things really well, essentially what it does is it's a Swiss army knife. It has a knife, it has a screwdriver, it has a corkscrew. Like it has a bunch of different things that each do a task well and it's not one thing that does everything well. Now, that's not to say that a method can't be good at everything, right? So for example, you can have something like a, 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 neur a neural network. Neural network can learn lots of different things, but it can only really learn to do one sort of thing at a time, okay? So that's what I mean by a strong or general AI. The same neural net that identifies uh, puppy dogs in images is not the same neural net that recommends movies on Netflix. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say here. Okay, so let's see what the person who created the term artificial intelligence had to say about AI. So John McCarthy is a Turing Award winner. The Turing Award is like the Nobel Prize of math and computer science. Um, and he died in 2011, unfortunately, but he, he did a lot of great things for computer science. And he coined the term AI. And he said, artificial intelligence is the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent computer programs. It is related to the similar task of using computers to understand human intelligence, but AI does not have to confine itself to methods that are biologically observable. Okay, so that is very important. A lot of people will, out there will say things like, oh, neural nets are true AI because they mimic how the brain works, right? It doesn't matter. You, if you have a machine that appears intelligence, that is artificial intelligence, okay? So it doesn't have to be a method that is replicated somewhere in the natural world. That is not, now that might be, uh, for example, there is nature inspired computing, there's bioinformatics, there's biologically inspired AI, sure. But AI in general does not have to be something that works how the brain works or how a bee might work or et cetera, et cetera. So I actually prefer the term machine intelligence to artificial intelligence because if something's intelligent, it's intelligent, right? 
you know, Stockfish chess program or AlphaGo playing Go is intelligent. It's very intelligent at doing that thing. It's not artificially intelligent. It's just really intelligent at it. So I think machine intelligence is a better term. So like non-biological intelligence, something like that. So artificial intelligence is the science of make com making computers do things that require intelligence when done by humans. Maybe that's another possible thing. But you can see that like trying to lock down and define AI is just an exercise in futility right? So just take this as a sort of, you know, if anyone comes up to you and says that they know a definition for AI, well, tell them to contact me because I certainly don't. This is sort of the closest that we get to a term for AI. And as I said before, AI, modern AI is a buzzword that companies use to sell you more diapers or toasters or whatever, right? Or get you to sign up for the latest whatever. So just be careful when you see AI, um, advertised by people. So, okay, enough with definitions. Let's try and categorize AI a little bit. So if you try to categorize like all of artificial intelligence in the field of computer science and mathematics and statistics, it's pretty big, right? It's not limited to what's here on the screen, but this is sort of um, a good overview of the most popular methods that or the most popular subtopics within artificial intelligence. So you get subtopics like machine learning. So machine learning is a subtopic within artificial intelligence. You get things like natural language processing. Um, so trying to understand text, tr trying to translate text. Speech, so speech to text, text to speech. That's a sub, um, can, can be seen as artificial intelligence. Expert systems are this really old form of AI that we're not going to be talking about in this course. What we are going to be talking about in this course is a lot of this planning, scheduling, and optimization. So things like pathfinding in video games or um, how they schedule final exams at the university, stuff like this. This is um, essentially a search-based problem. It's not always search-based, but we're going to do some search-based stuff. That is a subfield of AI. A lot of robotics um, is AI and a lot of computer vision is AI, right? And you can also see how it's not only this like hierarchical structure, but there's this horizontal communication as well because machine learning can be used in, ro in, in vision, right? And computer vision can use machine learning. And um, machine learning actually can use some search techniques within it as well. And so uh, there's just a lot of different types of AI. We'll be focusing on a couple in this course, not even coming close to mentioning all of them, okay? And the reason we're not gonna mention all of them is because I really want you to get your hands dirty and code and learn some of these rather than just having heard about them at some point and memorized it for an exam and forgot about it. Trust me when I say that after you do these assignments, you will not forget these algorithms. Okay. Who knows who this person is? Type, type in the chat if you know who this person is. If you don't, well, I'm sad that you're in computer science. <laughs> okay. Got a good uh, couple of keen students out there already. So this is Alan Turing. Alan Turing, basically the father of modern computer science, right? Um, Alan Turing, whose life was tragically cut short, I'm not going to get into all that. Um, he basically won World War II for the Allies with his code breaking and stuff. Brilliant, brilliant human being. Um, wrote a paper called Computing Machinery and Intelligence. And this was before the first computer, right? where he's already asking questions about AI before computers were invented. So Alan Turing, who is much smarter than I am, said that definitions, even the definition of machine is difficult. And the definition of think is also difficult, right? What does think mean? Is a computer thinking? Is a human thinking? Is it all just electricity? Does it even matter? And he said, the original question which is, can machines think, I believe, too meaningless to deserve discussion. Instead, he posed the question as a game, okay? And that is the imitation game. So there's a movie out there called The Imitation Game, um, which was about Alan Turing and uh, his work on the Enigma. 
or cracking the Enigma machine. So the imitation game that Alan Turing proposed was the following. You have a computer, A, and you have a human, B. You have a human interrogator down here, C, and is separated by some barrier, whether it's physical or whatever, doesn't know which of these two are a human or a computer, or even if there are a human and computer. And it's the job of the human, C, to pose questions to across the wall or across the barrier. And based on the result that they get, can the interrogator determine which of the responses was from a human and which was from a computer, right? So this was the very early form of what we come to know now as the Turing test, right? So the Turing test is the standard interpretation of that imitation game. And it's, can computers exhibit behavior which is indistinguishable from humans in some form, right? It doesn't need to be like, can you tell me four plus six, 10, right? It could be, write me a poem or design me a video game or so, like any abstract question. Are you going to be able to tell whether or not like the response you got was from a human or a computer? Now, you may want to say that this, you know, the Turing test should be general. Can you tell if this is a robot or a human or whatever? But the actual imitation game and Turing test is for a specific domain, right? Is can, it, does it pass the Turing test for this? Does it pass the Turing test for that? That's the, that's the standard interpretation of it. Versions of this has been asked for centuries. So Turing was not the first smart person, was not the first person to even think of a machine having intelligence. So back in the 1600s, Descartes, who's one of the founders of modern science, um, it basically, well, I don't want to say invented, but one of the popularizers of the modern scientific method of the elimination of doubt, he was talking about automata. So back in the 17th, 16th century even, they had automata that could do things. Like they could write on a piece of paper. Like after this, go to YouTube and look for uh, the writing boy. It's a machine built in like the 1700s that was programmable that could write and sign letters and stuff. It was crazy. Um, Diderot talked about a parrot, right? So if a parrot can, can reproduce English or whatever language you speak to it in, is it thinking, right? Is it being intelligent? And Ayer talked about the consciousness of machines. And so this is not the time or place to go into the details of all of that, but just be aware that this question has been posed for a long time, right? Alan Turing did not invent the idea of machines having intelligence, but he certainly went into a lot of detail. What I'm going to show you now is a, a thought problem that I really like because I think that it's, it's really thought provoking and it, it really nails the problems with asking, do machines think and all this kind of thing. So this thought process is called the Chinese room. Now, Searle in 1980, who came up with this, he called it the Chinese room. It could literally be any language, okay? It's just that when he was thinking about this, the, the, um, the symbols used in the Chinese language, right? So let's say Mandarin, for example. I know there's different Chinese languages. But let's say the symbols used in Mandarin, they're very difficult for someone who, does not, who, who speaks English to understand. They're basically not understandable, right? So it was just the random choice of a language that's hard for this person who spoke English to understand. So over here, we've got uh, Mr. President and we've got myself. So here's the Chinese room thought experiment. If you have someone in this room, this person in here does not speak English and does not speak Chinese, knows neither of the languages, okay? Over here, you have someone who speaks Chinese, but not English. Over here, you have someone who speaks English, right? But not Chinese. So, and I mean, different permutations of this could be, could be brought up. This person inputs some message written in that language, happens to be Chinese. This person takes those stones or those symbols, looks at it, okay? Takes this written symbol, looks at it, and has a big book in front of them. And they just 
flip pages in the book until they find the symbol. And then that symbol correlates to some string of characters in English. And so what they do is they take the input symbol, they look it up in a big book, and they pass the output symbol in the new language. And so this person understands what this person says. Now, I know, come on, like language is a little bit more complex than an individual symbols, but you get the idea, right? And the point of this experiment was to say, is the person inside here doing something intelligent, right? To the outside observer, this box is intelligent. It's translating between two languages. That is something that takes intelligence, right? But is it actually being intelligent? So by looking up rules and performing translation, the person inside the box appears to know the language and appears to be intelligent. John Searle argued that all computers do is that. This is literally quite, and I, I know people use literally, not literally anymore, but a computer literally does this, okay? It gets a symbol, it looks up what it has to do in a table, and it does it. So, there's no understanding of the semantics happening for a computer. And so, even if a computer appears to be intelligent, or it appears to pass the Turing test, John Searle argued that the understanding of something was the intelligence part. And so the Turing test is not adequate to say whether or not machines can think or machines are intelligent. So you've got all of the smartest people in the world in computer science and AI all saying different things, right? So do machines think? Can machines think? It's a hard question right? And there have been literal PhD thesis and books and even courses about this sort of topic in philosophy, okay? So if someone asks you, you know, is AI real? Can computers think? You can either A, tell them that, tell them what Alan Turing said and that um, I believe, I believe it too meaningless to deserve discussion. Maybe you're, you know, you'll be kicked out of the party. Um, or you can launch into like a 20 minute explanation of the problem like I just did. So it's interesting though, right? Like it's actually interesting. Machines appear to have intelligence. However, do they understand? Do I understand? I'm just like gray matter and electricity. Like, do I actually understand? I think I understand. You understand what I'm saying? Anyway, so all of these definitions, can machines think blah, blah, blah. Okay, what can AI do? Maybe that's a better question, right? So you could define AI in terms of what it can do or something like that. All right, so what can AI do? That's, uh, maybe we'll go into that. Planning and scheduling. This is my particular bread and butter. This is where my, that's why I'm listing it first because I'm not biased whatsoever. Planning and scheduling. Algorithms that are not necessarily machine learning for planning things like a trip, so I think here I, went, I uh, went into Google Maps and I plotted from the Avalon Mall to Signal Hill. 18 minutes, here's your trip. Here's an alternate route, okay? This route is uh, longer, but it goes down uh, Prince Philip, so it's faster, right? So planning and scheduling of things. We are actually going to be talking about that in this course, and it's my favorite part of the course. Um, so you'll be learning... After assignment two, you will know the algorithm that Google uses and you will have implemented it. Now, of course, not on the same scale as their maps, but you will know what they do. Uh, autonomous control is also something that AI can do. So, I mean, we have self-driving cars. They're here, right? All the robots driving around, little Amazon cars. Um, Uber is trying to get into self-driving cars. Tesla, you know, for the past seven years, Tesla has said that self-driving cars are right around the corner. But... It's a huge area of research and autonomous control is one of the, the areas of society where AI may have the most immediate impact, okay? Image and pattern recognition. So believe it or not, uh, whether you choose to believe this, like 90 plus percent of all of your letters that have been sent since the 80s 
have been scanned by machines. So the optical character re recognition, uh, this is called LeNet, and it was made by Jan LeCun, who is currently the head at of uh, AI, Facebook AI research at, I guess, Meta now. Um, so he was one of the, the real founding fathers of deep neural networks or convolutional neural networks and how, I guess not deep, but convolutional neural networks for character recognition. So like your mail has been scanned by machines for decades, right? This is not a new type of research. Um, and I recently watched a video on YouTube uh, that was fascinating. So across the United States for, like I said, for decades, they have had optical character recognizers for mailing addresses because you can't have a person looking at every mailing address right? And putting it on a, um, uh, a conveyor belt at the, the post office. Over the years, they have gone from, so they have these centers where they have humans. And whenever a picture is taken of a letter and the machine has a significantly low probability of belief of what the digit is, it goes in front of a human and the human tries to figure it out. Okay. And they used to have multiple of those centers in every state in the country, in the, in the U S they had hundreds of these centers and the information from every state was sent to that center. And like, you just be there, your job all day was to look at things and type it in, look at things and type it in. They have one processing center in the entire country now because this has gotten so good, um, over the years. So they used to have to do billions and billions of letters every year. And now it's like hundreds of thousands or something like that. Like image recognition has gotten really good. We also have things like pattern recognition, facial recognition. Um, you know, you can look at your phone and unlock it. It knows who you are. You can um, track people if you're the government, right? Lots of crazy, scary uses for these type of technologies. Um, healthcare. Uh, Things like telerobotic surgery. So they can do telesurgeries now. You can control robotics surgeons from across the country or the world if you have to. Um, something that I'm really excited about is for the last two decades or so, um, humans have actually gotten better than doctors at diagnosing brain tumors. So like they, they have image processing techniques that can track the spread of brain tumors in the brain. So they can identify using machine learning and image processing, what are healthy parts of the brain, what aren't healthy parts of the brain. And so like computers are already better than, than doctors at this. It's just that, you know, you still have to have a doctor in the middle to, to verify. And just in case that like small percentages of the time where the, where the, the AI is wrong, you don't want to cut someone open without um, checking. Robotics, of course, of course, robotics, you know, you've got to build, um, your robots. So here we have um, Boston Dynamics being tortured by one of the people there. They have uh, their robot. We can have swarm robotics. We have military robotics, all sorts of different robotics problems that I'm sure you're familiar with um, that I don't even need to go into. We have musical composition, right? So AIs are writing music now and they're writing music that is indistinguishable from human music. It's just insane. Like they did this study where they had classical music and they played it to music students at a university and said, did a human write this or did a computer write this? And they were guessing no better than chance, right? So like musical composition, and this of course is, is just, this is, um, oh, I can't remember the name of this robot band, but if you search like robot band on Google, this, these, these guys come up here, but music is being written by humans. Art is being done by humans. And <laughs> In a lot of ways, it's catching up to humans. There's things called style transfer, where you like give it a video and an image and it redoes the video in the style of the image. Um, here we have uh, Google Deep Dream, which is this sort of nightmare fuel, a uh, compressor head, thank you. So this is compressor head, the band here, if you wanna go look them up. Um, who has used Dolly? So OpenAI's Dolly 2, I got access to it and I typed in some sentences for it to create for me. And uh, me and my girlfriend, we have uh, pets. We have cats and ferrets as pets. So I used cats and ferrets as some of my prompts for this. So here is a sentence that I typed into Dolly 2. 
an oil painting of a ferret in a wedding dress getting married to a black and white cat in a tuxedo standing near a lake. Like, I'd pay someone $50 to, to, to draw these. I get infinitely many of them at the push of a button now. Isn't that crazy? Like, yeah, it doesn't get it exactly right, but that was like my first try at this, right? Just crazy, and it's an oil painting. Here is a ferret holding a magic wand and casting a spell by the ocean in the style of digital art. Look, it, it gets the style right, it, like a ferret with a casting a spell, it kind of knows what that means. I mean, this one looks like a pirate for some reason, but like, it's incredible. Imagine if you're a video game company and you used to need to employ a bunch of artists to get concept art, and now you can just use AI. Because I'd play that game. Wouldn't you play this game? It looks amazing, right? Speaking of video games, here's something I did. Top-down view of a new dungeon map for an RPG game. And here's what it generated, right? Like, I can take inspiration from this. Like, that's pretty cool. The art style over here is pretty neat. Like, this is a cool little thing. It's got, like, a little thing here. Like... And that's just Dolly 2, right? So yeah, okay, that's that's pretty um that's that's pretty amazing. And I mean, this is just Dolly 2. That's the only one I have access to, and I'm not saying that it's the best one, but for right now, that's what I can type things into. All right. If you take Computer Science 4303 with me in a future year, we'll talk about procedural content generation. And that has to do with algorithms and AI techniques for actually creating video, video game content. Algorithmically, not with deep neural nets. Excuse me. I have the hiccups. Language processing and translation. If you have um, a Google phone, or if you have Google Translate, I'm not sure if this works on Android, um, but if you have, like I have, um, I have an Android phone here. If you open up Google Translate, and you, you can do this live translation, like what it's showing here actually works. I've gone to a Japanese restaurant and pointed my phone at a Japanese banner and it translated it into English, live with the camera open. Insane. And that's been going on, that's like six years old now. And obviously we're gonna take over the world, right? Because why else would you want artificial intelligence? That when you say AI to a random person, this is what you think of because this is what Hollywood sells you, right? But, I mean, watch the movies, they're all excellent, but no, AI is not just for taking over the world. Game playing. I like AI and game playing because it can, it can play games really well. This exact slide, okay? This exact slide I have had in my AI talks for 10 years. And when I started giving these talks, computers were only at an amateur level when it came to playing Go, okay? It's an Eastern Asian board game. Um, and now, with AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero, computers are way better than humans at playing Go. So in just the amount of time that I have been lecturing, the world has changed in terms of game playing and AI. Uh, I actually hold, I'll, I'll talk about that a bit later. I'll talk about StarCraft. Okay, so that's some of the things that AI can do, but how do we make new AI? All right, so AI research and development. How do you actually do that? Believe it or not, it's not just find a neural net that can do what you want, right? Although there's a lot of publications like that out there. First, we want to identify a problem or an area to work in. So let's say, for example, um, I have Google Maps. I'm, I'm the people at Google Maps. I have a bunch of maps. I want to be able to navigate from A to B. I want them to be able to navigate like almost instantaneously. I want it to think for two seconds and then give me a path back. After I've identified a problem, what I have to do is a review the literature of existing techniques. So when it comes to research, academic research, it's not like industry. So in industry, if someone has a really good idea, someone else can steal it and market it better and get all the credit. In academia, whoever publishes it first 
gets the credit, okay? So what you have to do is you have to go out there and you have to make sure that nothing else exists, right? Well, not nothing else, but you have to go see what exists and then either A, decide if that's good enough, or B, say, that's not good enough, let's make it better, okay? So you need to review all the papers that exist out there. And if you want to do a very specific thing, like let's say I, I came up with this new algorithm and I'm gonna call it the Dave algorithm. But if I go out and see in the literature that that exact same algorithm exists, if I go try and publish my new Dave algorithm, it will not be accepted because it already exists, right? So you have to review the literature for existing techniques. Then in general, you're gonna develop new techniques, right? Then you're going to test those new techniques to see if they're better than what currently exists under some specific controlled circumstances. And then you apply the technique to the problem. Okay, so there's, yes, there's, science is not just like going into a lab and mixing stuff and, <laughs> in beakers, there's an actual scientific process that you have to follow if you want to be successful in creating new techniques. And this is what you have to do. You have to look at, decide on a problem, see what's been done, try and make your own stuff, test your own stuff, and then apply the new stuff. All right. So if that is the case, how do we test new AI, right? So if you think, okay, what kind of hole have I dug myself into here? I just spent the last, what, almost an hour talking about how difficult it is to define intelligence. So how in the hell are we going to test for intelligence if we can't even define intelligence, right? Well, here's the cool thing. We can play games. Because games measure intelligence. Now, this is not the only way, but this is by far the most fun way, right? If you come up with a new technique and it's able to play chess better than the old technique, then it is more intelligent in the domain of chess than the old technique. There you go. And in my opinion, everything is a game, right? Pretty much everything. Not just, not just Nintendo, Sega, PlayStation, Microsoft. I'm talking every, like life is a game. What is a game? Let me, let me prove for you what I just said. What is a game? You have an agent in an environment. That agent can take actions and those actions affect the environment. The agent has a goal. Defeat the opponent. Move to the right. Solve the puzzle. Get the most points. It's the maximization of some function, right? Well, it turns out I'm an agent in an environment. You are an agent in an environment. You have a goal. Your goals may be hierarchical, right? Your overall goal might be live as long as possible or be as happy as possible, right? Part of being happy might involve uh, eating, <laughs> right? Drinking. So that in, or having shelter, those things involve maybe making some money, right? Having a relationship all these things. So you have goals that you are trying to maximize. Your game, your real life game, you know, it has more dire consequences than a game of chess, but nonetheless, it still follows the same sort of process where you can apply algorithmic decision-making techniques to these games. Games can simulate the real world. And if the game is difficult enough, Game AI success can translate into real world success. Also, there are no ethics approval re required for games, right? So for example, some of my research has to do with playing StarCraft and teaching, you know, my Marines to defeat Zerglings as, as most efficiently as possible. Imagine trying to do research on like real live battle. Like you'd never be able to do it, right? So you can just fire up a game have all the game entities shoot each other, no problem. And I mean, it doesn't have to be shooting. It could be checkers. It could be whatever. It's cheap. It's really, really cheap to test a video game versus buying a $100,000 robot versus buying a, like a self-driving car and crashing it, all that kind of stuff. Games are super easy to visualize. They're intuitive to understand. 
they are fun to program and play, and all of this makes them very motivational for people to learn, to people to program in, to do their assignments, hopefully to do well in the course. Wink, wink. So over the course of the last 50 years or so, we've been having these human versus machine competitions. So this is chess, checkers, Go, video games like StarCraft. It turns out that pretty much every single popular board game or traditional board game at the very least Machines are now way better than the world's best humans. Machines are approaching the skill of the world's best humans in video games, but have not yet surpassed them in all games. Okay. Um, so we've got some work to do. So let's do that. All right. Also, not only is it an interesting academic problem, but video games are a huge business, right? So games just making better games is cool, right? It, it creates jobs, it entertains people, etc. And what are the benefits of game AI to the video game industry? Well, you get better in-game AI, so you get more intelligent NPCs, you have better single-player experience, you could create offline tools for game balancing, you could reduce human testing. Think about it, instead of like having game testers trying to jump Mario out of bounds to test your games, you just have AI do that millions and millions of different possible button permutations. Just test your game using AI. And you could apply it to more areas as well than just game AI, right? You could apply it to robotics, to self-driving cars, all sorts of stuff. Right, so that's sort of my spiel on AI, why it's hard to define and lock down, um, why it's hard to say if machines actually have intelligence. Um, so I gave some examples of what AI can do, some benefits that it has, what are we doing at MUN for AI? Now, just as, a, as an upfront, I'm just gonna give a couple of slides on what uh, me and my students have been doing at MUN. So I run the MUN AI and Games Lab. It's right next to the senior computer lab in, um, uh, at MUN in the computer science department. It's actually a physical lab. Um, you know, we have some funding from different places around the world and from inside Canada. Here are some former students of mine. Um, they, they did a bunch of different work. So Rory did uh, strategy game AI. He did machine learning. Uh, Caroline did uh, reinforcement learning for swarm robotics. Rick did um, deep learning for StarCraft II. Lucas did a search algorithm for uh, StarCraft. Like lots of different different games and AI marriages in this, um, in this lab. So it's, it's, if you are thinking of, you know, eventually doing AI, for a master's or a PhD, we've got a lot of different stuff happening at MUN that's really interesting. So some of the current research projects, um, there's a StarCraft AI competition happening next month at MUN. So the AIIDE StarCraft AI competition, which is the longest running computer AI competition that I know of. So StarCraft bots compete against each other. We've had Facebook, we've had uh, Samsung, we've had big companies, really smart AI. This actually is held at MUN in that lab. So if you've ever heard of the StarCraft AI stuff, that actually happens at MUN. We host that. Now there are other ones, but we host that one. So there are StarCraft AI competitions. Um, I organized it along with Rick. Uh, this, oh wow, this slide is old. That's to 2022. Um, and we've held it at MUN every year since I've been here. So since 2016. There's also the Computational Intelligence in Games Conference, the Student StarCraft AI competition. People from all over the world do this. People from all sorts of companies uh, participate. Um, so it's really cool to, to do this sort of research. Um, I've also done some autonomous robotics, reinforcement learning, uh, automatic pattern formation. So we've written this like um, this particle simulator and we can have robots driving around in this simulator and we do uh, pattern formation. So here we have a little robot in blue that's organizing these puck structures. So these red pucks into like an oval shape and we use reinforcement learning to do that. So we don't have to spend hours and hours hand coding these algorithms to do, to do things for us. Um, I do research into uh, real-time strategy game stuff. So combat algorithms. So, you know, how do we most efficiently kill the opponent in a real-time strategy game? So we have done like simulators for battle for real-time strategy games. Um, we have done, uh, this is a reinforcement learning package for StarCraft II that exists. So there's an official uh, machine learning package for StarCraft II. 
We've done AI for video game development and design. I have one student now doing procedural content generation for like, uh, for 2D platforming maps. Um, lots of different types of projects going on. It's really fascinating. Um, Mun does have a lot of courses that cover AI and video games. So for example, you have this course, so 3200, which is intro to AI. We have 3201, which is nature inspired computing. We have 3202, which is the machine learning course. It'll teach you all about machine learning. Um, the other course that I'm teaching this year is 4300. So that's intro to game programming, where we do a, a game engine in C++. And then my other course is sort of, if you take 3200 and combine it with 4300, you get 4303, which is this AI in computer games course that I teach. And that's it for the intro. So that's what this course is. Um, let me go back real quick to uh, our class schedule. So as you can see, that was the intro class. So right after this class is finished, I'm gonna update the spreadsheet. So it has a link to the slides, the PDF, so you can look at those. Also a link to this video, which is currently being given. So there's no link just yet. Next lecture, we're gonna go into agents and environments. Those are the definitions and all the terms that we need to know going forward with the rest of the course. And then next Tuesday, we are going to jump right into problem solving and assignment one. And I am going to have an entire stream dedicated to assignment one help and tutorial stuff, okay? So assignment one is where you're gonna start. Uh, if you've never used JavaScript before, don't worry. We're gonna have lots of help. I'm gonna have a whole lecture based on that. Um, so tune in there. You can see what I'm doing. You can follow along and you can do your assignment. I'm not gonna give you all the answers, but I'm gonna give you there's going to be a lot of hand-holding for assignment one, and that's going to be taken away for assignment two. So that's it for the lecture. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. I think this course is going to be really fun, and I uh, hope you had, as, as, uh, had a good time. And I'll see you on Thursday for the next lecture. Great. See you then.